everybody. It's Fantasy Author's Handbook on YouTube. Once again, I'm Phil. Let's talk about writing. Let's talk about this post on the blog, Fantasy Author's Handbook, that goes way back, uh, like nine years now, from May 5th, 2014, and I called it Chekhov's Gun and the Mental Inventory. And I'm going to call this video the same thing. Link will be provided below. What is that? What do I mean, right? Chekhov's gun. And in the original post, I showed a picture of uh, Walter Koenig as, as Ensign Chekhov from the original Star Trek series. Obviously, we're not talking about him as much of a Star Trek fan as I am. This is actually attributed to the Russian author Anton Chekhov. And you've probably heard this in some venue or another talking about writing books, about writing articles, about writing my blog, any edits from me, this comes up a lot for me. And why I am really want one of my first videos to really touch on this, what I think is a vital subject. And this is especially true, I think, for fantasy authors, science fiction authors in particular, where there's a lot of world building. In fact, world building is the thing that makes science fiction and fantasy in particular different from everything else. There isn't a lot of world building in, say, contemporary romance or even contemporary thrillers where you're, you know, you're starting out with, well, where do I set this? Chicago, New York, London, whatever. And the world as it is in real life is built for you. In fantasy, the world is built by you. In science fiction, you might be 20,000 years in the future, as I've now learned Dune is set at 10,000 years or 8,000 years. Um, it may be in a long, uh, you know, galaxy far, far away, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. How did I forget that? I'm going to press on. <laughs> um, but this is what Chekhov said, and, I, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing as much as anyone else you're ever going to see on, on the internet paraphrasing this. Uh, if you can find the absolute exact authentic quote and then translate it into English, please put it in the comments below. In fact, any time you can ever add any kind of context or new information to one of these videos, that's what the comments is for. I invite that. I, I want that. So anyway, here's what Anton Chekhov said. In the first act, if you have hung a pistol on the wall, then in the following one, it should be fired. Otherwise, don't put it there. Okay, so what does that mean? I think this is him reminding us that our readers, us being authors of anything, a novel, a short story, fantasy, science fiction, romance, realism, whatever, literary fiction, any story, our readers, the audiences of our play, movie, anything, are making in their heads a mental inventory as they're reading right? They may not be conscious of that. And, you know, in some cases, readers that now it's, it's popular to kind of give everything a so-called close read, which I think is good. I do that. Um, I'm often sitting with a pen and a book open. I've been doing that as I've been reading War and Peace, um, mostly just so that I don't, you know, forget what the heck is going on in that gigantic all over the place novel. Um, but even if you're just sort of casually reading, which is 100% perfectly fine to do, by the way, you don't have to feel like you have to close read everything. You're making this mental inventory, which is basically any time the author says something, gives you a piece of information, you're stacking that stuff up. And referring back to the blog, I'll, there'll be links to all this stuff. If you haven't read it already, and you should be reading it every Tuesday anyway, because it's updated every Tuesday. Um, but in just the last few weeks, I wrote a blog called the character description info dump. And this was, we'll say inspired by, if not demanded by my reading of war and peace, which I have just been trudging through, trudging through since January. Um, this is only the first of what I have a feeling will be plenty of negative examples from what is considered one of the greatest novels of all time. There was one particular chapter, this is in volume 404, so far into the book that in the edition that I'm reading, it was like page like 1690, something like that. There is a character who is introduced 
And on the blog, you can read the entire chapter. I just went ahead and just took the entire chapter and, and pasted it. It's well in the public domain. I can do that. Um, it, just to show that this was a, an entire chapter in which a character is described while the character is doing nothing. It is just sort of on other characters, but not really even that other character thinking, hey, this is, reminded me of this guy when he did the thing and how he kind of uh, sang and what his voice sounded like, stuff like that. Nothing, it was apropos of nothing, just an entire chapter telling us everything there is to need, everything apparently Leo Tolstoy thought we needed to know about this character. Here's just some of it. I mean, I'm not going to read this whole ridiculously long chapter for you. So if I'm looking up, I'm looking at my notes. His brilliantly white, strong teeth, which showed in two unbroken semicircles when he laughed, as he often did, were all sound and good. Okay, so we know that about his teeth. His voice was pleasant and musical. Fantastic. He baked, cooked, sewed, planed, and mended boots. Uh, planed, I think. I don't know, whatever that is. He did not sing like a trained singer, who knows he is listened to, but like the birds. That sentence, by the way, goes on for almost the rest of the next paragraph. He did not like talking about his life as a soldier, though he did not complain, and often mentioned that he had not been flogged once during his whole term of army service, which apparently is good, right? If you don't get, I mean, I get flogged like on a day-to-day -day basis. He would often say the exact opposite of what he had said on a previous occasion, yet both would be right. That's Now, that's a way Homer. That's something that we maybe, I don't want him to cut out. That's kind of an interesting, that's just a fun sort of collection of words that said something really kind of interesting. Anyway, finally, ending with, he could not understand the value or significance of any word or deed taken separately. Okay, so... In this entire chapter, and the chapters in War and Peace, believe it or not, are not long. There's just really lots of them. We get this info dump, right? A dump of information about this very minor character who shows up in like one or two chapters previous to that and so far has not come back into the rest of the book at all. So now we know all of this stuff about him. And what I read was, I am really need you to understand, barely scratching the surface. It was a couple thousand words. Our readers, Leo Tolstoy's reader, me, was making a mental inventory of all that stuff. What do we know about this guy's teeth? What do we know about this guy's singing voice? What do we know about whether or not this guy was flogged? All that stuff is in here. And again, your readers may not be actually literally taking a list, but in their heads, they're saying, ooh, I'm being told this, or I'm better yet, obviously. I'm being shown this. So everything must be somehow related or important. So now I've got this list of all this stuff about this very minor character. And if any of those things don't pay off by the end of this book, it will feel like missing pieces. And that's really what makes this whole concept of Chekhov's gun. If you show the gun, the gun has to do something, right? Because your readers, again, may not be able to say like, well, listen, I took this. I was taking extensive notes of this book and I've written down all of the things that I know about this minor character. And I checked off all the stuff that actually mattered. There was a scene where he sang and the, the French officers were so impressed that they gave everybody more soup that day or something, whatever it is. And again, it doesn't have to be, oh, this is the one thing upon, you know, little story element or reveal upon which the entire story hinges, the entire novel changes direction here. It can be very minor actions, little things, but there are things that are happening in the story. And anything that you leave on the table, well, I told you this about this guy, I told you that about that guy and they don't actually come into the story in any interesting way, just feels like you were hanging there. And we really just can't leave our readers hanging there. And again, they may not have that notepad, right, with everything listed out, checked off, but in here they have been sort of subconsciously 
Is that the word? Probably, right? And in the end, they may not be able to say, so you know, how do you like that book? Well, I, I, I don't know. It just seemed like I didn't, I don't know, right? Which is, to me, the worst thing anyone can say about a book. I would rather be hated than shrugged off. Don't say, like, I'm, uh, yeah. that's terrible, right? If, I'm, if, if there's something you dislike about one of my books, I want to know exactly what it was. Because I might just go like, well, that was I did that on purpose. Um, this book's just not for you. But if it's just kind of like, I don't know, it just felt like it wasn't good then this is the kind of thing that is getting in your way. That's what's causing that kind of non-specific dislike from readers. They may not be able to say consciously, there were a million loose ends, there were all sorts of things about characters that were just told and listed and I, none of it came to pass or this percentage of it didn't actually come wrap back up into the story. But they're going to feel it, right? And we're in the feeling of reading anything that we've written, a novel, a short story. And again, I don't care what the genre is. So if you're writing mysteries or literary fiction or historical fiction, this is for everybody, right? Fantasy and science fiction authors have that extra layer of world building. Historical authors also that extra layer of historical research that we really want to put in. We want to put in all of the world building. We did all the world building. We want to put in all of the forecasts of what the future is going to look like, the future of AI, the future of space travel, the future of humanity, whatever. Um, but the more of that you force in that doesn't actually move the story forward, the more you have this mental inventory that hasn't been checked off. Yes? And that's the thing, right? If you're putting something in anything you're writing, again, whatever it is, quote unquote, just because, or I've heard this a lot, well, it's, it's for color, it provides color. Uh, I would advise cutting that. Anytime anybody says, well, it's just there because it's just there for clutter, clutter or <laughs> color, sorry. See, look at the Freudian slip. I said it's just there for clutter when I was trying to say color. What does that tell you right there? It, Look, at, either cut it, right, or look at it as an opportunity and say, well, I now there's a gun hanging on the wall, to go back to Chekhov's kind of weird example. Uh, that was just there for color, just to kind of, like, describe the room. All right, great. So now it's an opportunity, maybe, right, for whatever it is, somebody to grab the gun and shoot. This is not always about violent action in even in genre writing it could very well be there's a gun hanging on the wall and somebody comes in who's not a gun person and if you're not a gun person and you go into a house where guns are hanging on the wall you get a little bit weirded out right or if you are a gun person and you walk in and you see a gun there that now there's a conversation oh hey is that a winchester rifle oh how old is that whatever it is right it's an opportunity so now characters are talking to each other Characters are talking to each other in a, in a sort of positive, friendly way, or somebody's creeped out, there's some sort of imbalance of mood there and so on. Now the gun is actually there and it's doing something. And he hasn't maybe had never comes down no one, from the wall, no one's holding it. Certainly no one's shooting it, nobody dies or anything like that. But the gun, and again, whatever that is, has now become at least some part of the story. If in War and Peace, there were characters who were interacting with this guy. And in previous chapters, they did. Pierre, you know, interacted with this guy. If Again, if they heard him singing, and now he's singing during the actual now of the story, and that somehow moves the story forward. Everybody's super depressed because they're prisoners of, of war, they're prisoners of the French. And his weird kind of bird-like voice cheers everybody up, or even if it's just like, it was so bad, but it just reminded us of home because he's saying these kind of goofy Russian folk songs or something like that. Whatever it is, right? This can move the story forward. This changes the tempo of it. This changes the emotional uh, 
tempo, to use the same word again, of the scene. And, and now it's something that's happening as we go that is moving the, the story forward in some way at all. If it's just there because it came to you and it's in your notes, no, man, it doesn't have to be in there. It's all about the story. Remember, it's all about the story. And I know that this can be hard, especially for the big epic fantasy world builders. I mean, like I spent 15 years, you know, as the Forgotten Realms line editor at TSR and Wizards of the Coast. And that was world building and then some more world building with more world building than anyone has ever done added on top of that. And there were certain authors who thought, well, they've got all this stuff. They gave me all this stuff. They kind of made me study all this stuff. Writing a Forgotten Realms novel from second edition forward was really more like writing uh, historical fiction. You had to get the facts right. Those facts were made up by Ed Greenwood or Jeff Grubb or me or R.A. Salvatore or whoever, but they were facts. Once they were published, that was the way the world worked. Yeah. But that I, so many times I had to tell authors, you don't need, you don't need that. You don't need it. You don't. You skip that. That's been in fifteen other books. You don't have to hit everything. You don't have to explain everything. You've got a fan base, and even if you don't, obviously you're not coming from something like that. If you're writing your own uh, original story and creating your own original world, you don't have that. You know that giant canon to fall back on. But even then, you don't just because you thought. Man, you know, how would money work here? You know, they've got... I, I was always fascinated by the sort of old English monetary system being an American. I mean, how does a... What's a... You know, a, how does a pence and a shilling work together? It's just... It was apparently confusing for the English as well. So that's kind of cool, though. I'm going to do a whole money setup thing. Okay. And so then you explain the money thing, but nobody then ever uses money. It never becomes a problem. Somebody just says, oh, that'll be three shillings and a sixpence. Okay. And they, and they pay for it. And now you have to explain the whole monetary system? No, you really don't. Just move on, right? But if, you know, those characters are coming from somewhere else and travel like an American traveling to England, just going, I have no idea what you're talking about. Let me just dump my wallet on the counter and you just do what you need to do. So, you know, that's really what it all comes down to, right? Is what moves your story forward? What moves your story forward? And what keeps your readers engaged with the story? Not with your world building, not with the contents of your notes, not with every single little detail. And I'm, you're going to see more videos like this from me that gets into world building in particular in fantasy and science fiction, but also gets into that sort of nitty gritty of detail. And is detail a bad word? It's a, it's a, it's a difficult world, word. It's a hot button word, I think, for the fiction author. When is, too, when is detail too much detail? Honestly, it's most of the time. So anyway, remember this. Chekhov's gun. Thank you, Anton not Ensign Chekhov. If in the first act you have hung a pistol on the wall, then in the following one it should be fired. Otherwise, don't put it there. You've been warned. Thanks, everybody. If you like this stuff, hit that like button. If you want more of this stuff, hit the subscribe button. It's free, and there's no Patreon. There's no firewall. There's no secret club. We, we know that already, right? Subscribing is 100% free, so just do it. What are you waiting for? Hit the blog every Tuesday. There's a Goodreads group now, Fantasy Authors Handbook Goodreads group. Everyone can join. Get in there. There's links below for everything. And comment anything. Phil, are you nuts? Hey, what, how do you have the you-know-whats to tear down Leo Tolstoy? I don't know. You know what? Listen, I, Tolstoy's legacy can handle a couple of YouTube videos that drag him out, right? So... <laughs> Thanks, everybody, and just subscribe. You'll see more stuff. Chekhov's gun and the mental inventory. They're all doing it. Your readers are doing it. Thanks, everybody.